Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem called Vocalism. This is a little two-part poem, poem number 14 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets, a celebration of the voice. Now we'll uh, remind you that in earlier lectures we commented that autumn representing that which is old rivulets, that which is new. And we're going to ask, obviously, to what degree and why would this poem, Vocalism, be placed inside of Autumn Rivulets? Now, Whitman himself was fascinated with oratory, with the voice. We've commented on singing and the like. And at the, end of this, uh, at the end of this presentation, we'll maybe even hear Whitman's voice. The only known recording of Whitman's voice, if we have time, will maybe play for you a, a few seconds of that, just so you can have a sense of Whitman's voice. It's hard to know if, in fact, Whitman's voice actually sounded the way that we hear because of some of the challenges of technology. But by all accounts, he wasn't the orator that he was writer. Although we will have pointed out that Whitman was a teacher, and uh, to that degree probably did speak quite a bit. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, and that you've been with us from the very beginning of inscriptions all the way up to and including a set of introductory comments on autumn rivulets, and then we just finished with uh, Behind the Mask. Now, as we have done in all of our previous comments, we are going to turn to our Nortons to get some background information in here. Nortons will give us quite a bit of information. A fusion, we're told, vocalism. A fusion of two poems in 1881, each of which had developed independently in all editions since 1860 of Leaves of Grass. There they had both first appeared. The first stanza of the present poem is number 12 in the Chance Democratic Cluster. The second stanza as a number 21 in a Leaves of Grass Cluster. With intervening changes in paraphrasing and titles, the poem of stanza 1 above became to or strius to in leaves of grass 1872 um, to 1876 where the second stanza also appeared in a separate poem voices in the conflation of 1881 the first stanza lost 13 lines while the second stanza dropped two the fusion was then successful for both parts celebrate the same theme the power of the voice which had so attracted the poet in his earlier years that he had seriously considered the possibility of becoming an orator. And of course, he lived during a time of great orators. We'll think, of course, of, of Ralph Waldo Emerson, but for sure we'll think of, of uh, President Lincoln and maybe the greatest of them all, Daniel Webster. Just to finish now, that when we reach the uh, set of lines uh, that end with globe, these uh, lines will be used by George Eliot in an epigraph for a chapter 29, book 4 of her novel Daniel Deronda from 1876. And much has been said, Norton's will say, about the interests that Eliot had, George Eliot had, for, uh, for Whitman. So let's now turn to the poem itself. And let's enjoy the gains that will be played with vocalism, by the way, a word that only gets used here. Now, you could make the argument that Whitman has always, in Leaves of Grass, been interested in the voice and the power of the voice. I mean, we'll even talk about Whitman's voice. Scholars, in fact, will speak about this. And when they do this, they don't mean the quality of his spoken voice. They mean, of course, the voice of his poetry and the way in which he will speak, as we commented in the last poem, directly to you. So it's going to be fascinating to hear him celebrate the idea of the, of the voice. Now, of course, two other comments, he's playing in that ancient tradition of the bard or the scop, that is to say the poet who can sing the great songs, and we think, of course, any number of times in Homer, both in the Iliad and the Odyssey, where the celebration of the voice is, is paramount. Also, I, uh, I want to point out, because Whitman's readers would know this intuitively, um, as opposed to often those of us today who will pick up the, a poem like this and read it. But for Whitman, his celebration of the voice will immediately make us think, or Whitman's audience think, of that moment in the Gospels mentioned in Matthew 7.29 or Mark 1.22, that when Christ spoke, he spoke as one having authority, and the people were just kind of blown away by this. Um, he spoke as one having authority, and I think they're standing behind this poem is, is some of that as well. Let's begin with part one. Vocalism, measure, concentration, determination, and the divine power to speak words. And, and obviously we think about the great demonstrations, we think about all the great orators, uh, Pericles and the great Greek orators, of course, of ancient tradition. Uh, obviously Socrates comes to mind, although in Apology he says he's not a good speaker. Are you full-lunged and limbered-lipped. It's, it's, it's wonderful to even be able to read these lines. You have to, you know, try to enunciate clearly, right? From long trial, and now we're going to get eight of these 
kind of rhetorical types of questions from rigorous practice, from psyche. In other words, why is it that some people, when they talk, you listen to them? Isn't that wild? We always obviously think about the great Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, you, you, all you got to do is just listen to his I Have a Dream speech. You cannot look away. You cannot listen away if you get my drift. In other words, there are certain people who when they speak, you just have to listen to them. They're so compelling. What is it about it? What is it? Is it that they have something physiologically that allows them to do this? Is it a matter of vigorous practice? Like, what is it? Do you move in these broad lands as broad as they? In other words, the voice of America. I hear America singing, obviously. Come duly to the divine power, back to the first line, to speak words. In other words, what is it that gives certain words the power to kind of amplify the human spirit? And why is that the case? And why is it that some people can speak and nobody really listens? Other people speak and they're like just blown away. What is that? I mean, where does that come from? I think Whitman was very interested in that. Both his speakers more probably as poet even. For only at last, after, we're going to get several, seven of these, after many years, after chastity, friendship, it's interesting he would mention chastity, it's probably in the, his understanding of the religious tradition, the, the great speakers out of that religious tradition, procreation, prudence, and nakedness, after treading ground and breasting river and lake, you'll remember this from breasting, from patrolling Barnegat, after a loosened throat, I love this, from full-lunged and limbered lip, we now come to loosened throat, after absorbing eras, temperaments, races, after knowledge, freedom, crimes, after complete faith, after clarifications, elevations, and removing obstructions, after these and more, it is just possible there comes to a man, a woman, the divine power to speak words. And of course, in Whitman's day, some of the greatest orators were in fact not male, but female. And, I mean, we think about the power of a single moment, so Journal Truth comes to mind, of being able to just say the right thing at the right time, and people, people are moved. People will see the power of that. So he asks an intriguing question, like, what is it that allows for that to happen? Then he says, toward that man or that woman, swiftly hasten all. None refuse, all attend. And, of course, this is that idea that when certain people start talking, that whole bunches of people will come to listen. And obviously standing behind all of this is for Whitman the example of Christ in the Gospels and we'll get obviously in the next poem to him that was crucified. So it's very possible that the placement of this poem right before to him that was crucified is, is necessary. Armies, ships, antiquities, by the way we're going to get 15 of these things listed. Libraries, paintings, machines, cities, hate, despair, amity, pain, theft, murder, aspiration, form in close ranks. They debouche, now here of course is why we're at Autumn Rivulets, right? This idea of uh, six times, this word has been used in Leaves of Grass, that is, that is to say, right, Rivulet. They debouche as they wanted to march obediently through the mouth of that man or that woman. In other words, good speakers have this tendency to just make it seem so unbelievably easy, carefree, the way that they're able to articulate so easily. And Whitman's just kind of blown away by this. Is he talking about Daniel Webster? Many have said probably. That's the one that he's probably speaking of more than any. They just had this amazing command of the language, the oratory command of the language. And now to the second part, which is a very, uh, a very brief second now follow-up. Oh, what is it in me? Right, and uh, you'll uh, this. We're, we're going to get this phrasing again in locations and times. We, you'll, you'll remember it two times. It gets used there. Oh, what is it in me that makes me tremble so at voices? You'll remember this centenarian story. The word tremble gets used here, and that makes sense because in centenarian story, you go back to it. You'll remember in drum taps that you've got this old old man telling the story, but clearly. The listener in the story, maybe Whitman as a young, as, as a nurse, right, uh, is, is captivated by the power of it. Obviously, at level 3A, we think here about Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And the way in which a young person can somehow be connected to the speech of the old mariner, right? Surely, whoever speaks to me in the right voice, him or her I shall follow, as the water follows the moon silently with fluid steps anywhere around the globe. And again, this is the uh, set of lines that George, uh, George Eliot would uh, put in her novel. The idea that when the right person speaks, and his use of, uh, uh, of the word uh, you know, right comes to mind here, and it will come back in a second. When the right person speaks in the right voice, 
I shall follow. In other words, we as humans are attracted to certain human voices, especially the ones that challenge us, that call us to something amazing. And I think obviously Whitman would hope that our study of Leaves of Grass is doing that for us. And then he'll say it, all waits for the right voices. Notice he, plural, he, he, he makes this as plural. It's not just one voice. It's a multiplicity of amazing voices, right? Where is the practiced and perfect organ? Where is the developed soul? And again, these rhetorical questions are fun. For I see every word uttered thence has deeper, sweeter, new sounds, impossible on less terms. It, it, in other words, there's, a, there's an evolutionary model here. Again, rivulets. There's an evolutionary model that's being played here. In other words, the next language, the next great uh, poet, uh, we think about our comments of uh, Amanda Gorman and her The Hill We Climb and her reading of that performance, uh, uh, that poetic performance there at uh, President Biden's inauguration. And we've given full comments on it at LearnStrong.net, but it's a compelling moment in time when she's standing, as Newton said, on the shoulder of giants. She's standing with all these poetic voices, including obviously Whitman. She was definitely channeling Whitman during the presentation of that poem. And the way in which, brilliantly, she's able to somehow transcend and include all the voices that came before. And of course, there will have been some young student who will be watching that and saying, someday, I will do that. And obviously, we, we, we love to play that game of the power of language. And obviously, Maya Angelou had a lot to say about her own upbringing and the promise that someday she would speak and millions would listen. And obviously, she played the same game in presenting a poem at an inauguration of President Clinton. Notice he finishes by seeing, I see... Brains and lips closed. This is very interesting. I see brains and lips closed, tempons and temples unstruck, until that comes which has the quality to strike and to unclose. I love that he uses this phrase, unclose. That is to say, to open up. Again, regulus. Until that comes which has the quality, two times now the use of the word quality, which makes us think, of course, of Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and the power of the use of that word quality, which takes us obviously back to our Plato study, right? To bring forth what lies slumbering forever ready in all words. In other words, the poet is the great predictor of awakening, right? And we think about one of the greatest prose voices as Thoreau, right, in, uh, in Walden, we commented on it, uh, we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, uh, not by mechanical means, but he will say that conscious endeavor, that, that, that focusing on a conscious endeavor, that's, that's, I think, the game that's being played here by Whitman. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant little poem. Um, at 2A, I think he's arguing that the great speaker, the great artist, always awakens the slumbering soul, always awakens the slumbering spirit. That's what we long for. And in some ways, that's what, for some of us, is the reason that we love to keep reading Leaves of Grass, because Whitman's voice keeps calling to us in powerful ways. He does that at 2B, obviously, through the repetitions after seven times, the rhetorical questions eight times. It's a compelling way uh, to, to read this poem, to pay attention to the, to the kind of vocalism that's being played in the very poem called Vocalism. At 3A, I, I challenge you to go back and take a look at Emerson's uh, Divinity School address. The fact that Thoreau is there in that address purportedly, and again we've exegeted it at LearnStrong.net and, uh, and a whole bunch of other of those Emerson uh, essays, that many, several of them were speeches. But that one especially, the power of that speech to, to call out a young Thoreau, that would lead to Walden, that would ultimately of course allow for both Gandhi as well as for King to draw so heavily on those ideas of civil disobedience. It's, it's an amazing idea. We obviously mentioned George Eliot's uh, Daniel de Ronda, uh, 1876, and her love of Whitman and the way in which Whitman captured so much of the language that Eliot herself would try to, uh, to try to capture. Since we're here at 3A, I'll give you a few moments um, of uh, Whitman's voice. Uh, we only know, to our knowledge, one of these. He was reading the uh, little poem, America, from Sands at 70. We'll get to it near the end of our study. And it'll be hard to hear much of this, but I want to just play it. And you obviously can run this to ground on your own time as well. The, the voice of Whitman, to the best of our knowledge, here it is. Simply, you
comment when we were playing around with uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, Wasteland as well as Four Quartets that there are recordings of Eliot reading his material but for example we'll often say man he just does not do the performance that for example an Alice Guinness can get to us uh, and we've given those uh, we've given those comments at learnstrong.net as well but I find it fascinating is sometimes poets can read their stuff and it's just mesmerizing and other times poets can read their stuff and it's not that great um, uh, we wish obviously that we could have way more of Whitman's voice captured it's unfortunate for us that the technologies didn't arrive however we could argue that we do have Whitman's voice, don't we? And it's here, it's buried, of course, in these poems. And I think that you hear Whitman's voice the best, as I have said many times, when you're alone or you're together with those you love and you're at the park, maybe if you're taking your children to the park and you just read out loud, it's a lot of fun. Especially some of these poems, they just read so beautifully. Finally, at 3B, how are we gonna own a poem like this? Take it personal, if you will. Who is the greatest speaker that you ever heard that was able to move you in powerful ways and you just never could, you never could forget them? It's, it's what um, Whitman says in A Song of the Open Road about walking under a tree and you never forget it the way you never forget certain people that you meet. Uh, it, it's very possible um, that, you know, hearing leaves of grass is awakening you and your voice. I would challenge you to enjoy more of Whitman's voice. Thank you.